feasting on daily bread. And the reason I use the word feasting is because historically for many of us at this time of year we would be at what we would call the feast. And when we think about the feast, what do we think about? So I want you for a moment here, I'd like some input if I can get it from you. What is it that you enjoyed about the feast for those that have a history of the feast? Jeanette. Excitement of going places and meeting old friends. Anybody else? I can tell you it was food. Food and money to buy food and get what I wanted. I can, you know, that, that was a big, big deal. Okay? So how many years did you go to the feast? up till we stop. So we're talking 63, that's 30 plus years, and my wife has gone to the feast for, I don't want to give away age, how many years? 62. And I've been going to feasts uh, since, yeah, yeah, in the mid-50s, so a lot of years. Somebody ask you another question. Tell me about the sermons. Tell me about there was one sermon, uh, 32 years and there was one sermon? This man spoke of love. This man spoke about oh, love. Oh, good. And I, I, I even have the tapes sometimes. Oh, good. That sermon. Oh, good. He spoke about love. Oh, you have the tape somewhere, but you don't know where. No, no. But I, I mean, it's that important, but you don't know where it's at. No. You can't find it, can no. you really? No. Yeah. I never he spoke about love. I never heard love talk about it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just you know, because, again, I, too, like you. When we think about the feast, and what I want to, for, to get across to us today, that the daily bread that we talk about, and when we talk about communion, which is the bread and the wine, it is, a, in essence, a daily feast. The, when you think, and I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and you, and you mentioned love, that probably if you take your loved one out to dinner, what's the best place that you want to be seated? The best place. If you're taking your spouse, your love, out to dinner, what kind of table do you want? Good table. What is a good table? One that's not by the kitchen door. What else? When it's not by the... How about a table for two? Yeah. It's a table for two for me that stands out because it's just you and that other individual that you love. When we think about going and, and feasting on the daily bread, it is in part about our personal relationship with God. And his being present with us and us being present with them. As it were, enjoying the moment, feeling a, a, a comfort about that, which is not unnatural. You feel safe. You feel secure. You feel loved. You're happy. There's a joy. All of those things are taking place. When we think about communion with Jesus and the feast that we, in essence, have, the emotional, spiritual feast that we have with him, it is a very, very enjoyable time. And it's more than seven or eight days or a day occasionally. It rather is a daily experience. And that's why when Jesus mentions, when he, he was asked, how do we pray? In Matthew chapter 6, he's quoted as saying in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. And thinking about this particular sermon, it really started off as communion 
one in communion. And then as I was thinking about it, it's connecting it with the feast. And because there are things that we all miss about the feast, as you're talking about, Jeanette, we miss meeting uh, groups of our old friends. We miss the getting out of the world because uh, we, we, we kind of got out of the world. We, we miss the planning and the preparation that we did. Uh, we also miss the financial freedom because the, having saved 10% of your income to go to the feast and to spend it on whatever you would like and that meant you could go out and you weren't worried about finances and the like. And then you just food, fellowship, fun, worship, just, and then a, a whole host of people around you because it, it wasn't just you. There were thousands of others. I tend to think that when Jesus goes somewhere, he's kind of accompanied with a few other individuals or spirits. There's a whole holy host kind of around him and the like. So as I was thinking about this this morning as I was driving to Santa Rosa, I get thinking, okay, what, what, and my first thought was, well, what am I going to say to them? How am I going to get across the point? And then I, I came back to this, wait a minute, what, what do you mean? What are you going to say to them? So I, I want to say what Jesus, I feel like Jesus wants to say about coming to his table, feasting on the daily bread. And so basically what we're going to read today are all things that Jesus says about it. We're going to start with 10 verses in the book of John. We're going to talk, start also in that particular context with um, the context of unbelief. Uh, people whose, whose lives are rather tragic in the moment because they live in a government under Herod, uh, they, they're living in slavery, as it were. They live under a governed state, uh, governed by the Romans. Uh, their religious leadership is rather political, to say the least. It's very, very political. And so they, they encounter Jesus, and these are people who are hungry. They're hungry in a lot of ways. They're hungry spiritually. They are also people who are impoverished and hung, hungered physically. And so let's begin here in John chapter 6, in verse 48 through verse 58. Here's what, uh, here's what we find Jesus saying here. He says here in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate man in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the rest of the world. I'm going to read through all of this and then come back. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up to the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And he taught this while he was at church, synagogue, in Capernaum. Now, with those thought in mind, let's look at some of the problems and the difficulties. Because, and, and this is the context in which I want to give us a backdrop. These are people who were, quote, God's people, God's nation, had been keeping feasts and all of that. And Jesus is introducing them to something different. And when he is, they ask about a sign, giving a sign, they're the ones who chose manna. Now, why, why manna? Well, because manna would attend to their immediate need. Feeling the blues today or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. 
we welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen. <laughs> 